What's up everybody, Rob here. So this is a continuation of my look at the 30 Years War, and this is specifically going to be talking about the aftermath of the defenestration of Prague. If you have not seen the other videos in this playlist, by all means check them out. It'll give you some context as to what's going on here. And this is a an absolutely massive subject, the easily the most massive subject I've ever tackled. And this is not going to be an exhaustive look at the Thirty Years' War, so I'm going to be leaving a lot out. So if you are familiar with what happened here and I leave out a part or something, yes, I did. Because, you know, this is for basically people who have no clue what's going on and, well, they just want to you learn more about this subject. If you're already well versed in it, you're probably not going to gain that much, but hey, you should continue watching anyway because I care not from whence the views come, only that they do. So without any further ado, here is the immediate aftermath of the defenestration of Prague. So after the imperial officials were chucked unceremoniously out of a window, the rebels moved very quickly to secure their position, ousting the Bohemian Chancellery and replacing Habsburg loyalists in other institutions throughout Bohemia with their supporters and basically just purging any sort of Habsburg loyalists from their ranks. Now, the new governmental forces immediately called up a draft. They called up conscription, hoping to establish an army, and they called up one out of every ten rural peasants, uh, male peasants, of course, and one out of every eight burghers, or townsfolk, and also diverted funds from the seized Habsburg treasury to fund a standing army. Now, very few actually answered the call, and by sem September of... 1618, the army totaled only around 12,000 men, and of these, about 4,000 were mercenaries. So really only about 8,000 people throughout Bohemia actually showed up to form an army, which was not very impressive. Now, the rebels were making it extremely clear that they were not actually rebelling against the Holy Roman Empire, but only corrupt governments within Bohemia. They were not rebelling against Ferdinand directly. Now, Keep in mind, though, that Ferdinand was not the Holy Roman Emperor at this point. It was still Matthias at that time, uh, but Matthias was very ill, and more and more government um, power was being vested into Ferdinand. It was pretty obvious that Ferdinand was going to be the successor when Matthias did uh, kick the bucket, but, you know, that hadn't happened yet. Basically, it was obvious that Ferdinand was the guy running the show, though. Um, however, in addition to his position as, well, not the Holy Roman Emperor, but, you know, soon to be um, Holy Roman Emperor. Uh, Ferdinand was also the Duke of Austria and the King of Bohemia, not just the Holy Roman Empire. So the rebels could rightly claim that they were attacking and overthrowing the corrupt governments of Bohemia, but not the empire as a whole. Now, nobody, especially Ferdinand, actually bought this. And Matthias was still the Holy Roman Empire, as I said, but as he was in declining health, there was very little doubt as to who his successor would be. Now, Ferdinand had been the dominant force in imperial politics, and it was obvious who this rebellion was actually directed at, and he kind of took it personally, and given that they were Protestants, and Ferdinand was a very hard counter-reformer, he was very eager to crush this rebellion. Now, it was very centralized at this point in Bohemia. It was still a Bohemian conflict, but its flames could very easily spread to the rest of the empire, and success in Bohemia could basically inspire Protestants throughout the Holy Roman Empire to rebel against the Habsburgs and Ferdinand and basically cause the entire Holy Roman Empire to fall apart. Unfortunately for Ferdinand, he was still forced to bide his time and gather support and to consolidate power. First thing he did actually was turn to his fellow Habsburgs in Spain, which, you know, Habsburg's family dynasty. Uh, Spain would eventually respond to this call for help, but only after very prolonged deliberation. They would be forced to divert resources away from a planned campaign in North Africa, although eventually 8.6 million ducats would flow from Spain to Vienna. Ferdinand also turned to a most unlikely ally, Johann George of Saxony, who, upon the outbreak of the conflict, sealed off his border with Bohemia, hoping to contain the rebellion. Now, he nominally supported the Habsburg cause, although Johann George was more in favor of conciliatory measures and peaceful resolutions rather than outright conflict. And many people actually have argued that his, I wouldn't say indecisiveness, but rather unwillingness to use force was one of the main causes why the Bohemian Revolt was able to fester into the Thirty Years' War rather than just crushing the rebellion outright. Alternate history, just something to think about. In any case, the rebels were trying to drag religion into the situation when, when Johann George and many others considered it to be a totally political situation. What's interesting about this was that Johann George himself was actually a Protestant, although he was in fact a Lutheran. And this just shows you divisions within the Protestant ranks, and it's not as simple as a Protestant versus Catholic conflict 
that's going on here, and you have Protestants on the Catholic side, you have Catholics fighting for Protestants, you'll see eventually. Basically, everything is this very long, messed up, confused, twisted thing, and putting it in simple Protestant versus Catholic terms is overly simplistic and oftentimes just flat out wrong. Well, in any case, while Ferdinand was trying to gather support, the rebel army under the command of Ernst von Mannfeld besieged and captured the city of Pilsen in eastern Bohemia on November 25th, 1618 a town which had remained loyal to Ferdinand. This was the first significant conflict of the war. Encouraged by the success, the rebels would split their forces with a portion of their army going after the Count of Boquet and another portion under Matthias Thurn sent to move towards Moravia, a strategically vital province of the empire. A third detachment under the command of Heinrich Schlick would eventually march on Vienna. Now, this would be a costly mistake. Now, rather than providing a single united hammer blow against the Imperials, the rebels in their divided state were too weak to actually do anything particularly useful, and as it was almost winter, the weather was being less than cooperative. Schlick's force would eventually reach Upper Austria, but due to the cold weather, his army would be ravaged by the cold, the diseases that inevitably followed an army of any significant size, as well as desertions, and would eventually be whittled down to less than 4,000 men, not nearly enough to take Vienna. Over the winter, the rebel force would be reduced to less than 8,000 men, divided amongst three armies. Over this time period, the Imperial forces were able to recover and form new detachments, including a Corsair regiment of 1,300 Walloons, who would be given over to the command of Count von Wallenstein, who eventually would break through rebel forces that were harassing Boquet. However, the action was pretty much at a standstill at this point, and things were, well, kind of at a stalemate, and there was still hope for a peaceful resolution. Then, on March 20th, 1619, Matthias died. Ferdinand, who had been really running the empire at this point, was in a position to actually take control of the empire directly as the Holy Roman Emperor. It was an elected position, so he basically had to secure his power base first. And in order to do this, Ferdinand was willing to make some concessions to just end the rebellion, including confirming various Bohemian privileges, as well as granting a general amnesty, basically saying, look, guys, if you everybody just puts on their weapons and goes home, we'll forget this whole thing ever happened he becomes the emperor. You get whatever you your privileges that you wanted. You know, end of story. Of course, the rebels rejected this because, well, this is the Thirty Years' War. We got like, you know, 29 more years to go. So, yeah, it pretty much the war was forced to continue at this point. So in the spring, the rebels, now reinforced with militia and mercenaries, invaded Moravia. Of the three regiments that were stationed there, one of them actually joined the rebellion, and Moravia was no longer able to stay neutral, though it had tried to up to this point. Matthias Thurn then turned this army southwards towards Vienna in order to besiege it and capture the capital of the empire. Ferdinand, who was not yet the Holy Roman Empire, was still in a very precarious political position and was unable to send any forces to stop them. In fact, the Protestant members of the city council were actually acting as a fifth column inside the city, ready to seize Ferdinand once Thurn made it to the city. Basically, well, once um, the rebel army showed up outside Vienna, and um, the, before the battle actually started, they would capture Ferdinand, turn him over to the rebels, and well, you know, end the conflict, you know, quickly from the inside. Some of them were even more emboldened than this, and a group of the councillors of Vienna. Uh, marched into the Hofburg Palace, the imperial residence in the city, and demanded that they see Ferdinand directly. And according to one story, one of these counselors actually seized Ferdinand directly. He managed to escape and locked himself in a room while he clutched at a crucifix while praying for help. And then, while he was there, besieged within his own palace, the winged hussars arrived. Well, okay, not quite the winged hussars, but a regiment of arquebusiers, which are basically mounted musketeers, they arrived and dispersed the rebels, much to Ferdinand's relief. And this unit, uh, just a small aside here, would later be designated as Dragoon Regiment No. 8 and would remain in service of the Austrian Empire until 1918. They and other reinforcements managed to make it to the city, and soon Vienna had over 5,000 soldiers manning the defenses. So when Thurn showed up, he was unable to maintain contact with the subversive elements in the city, and he also had no real siege equipment to speak of, and he was forced to withdraw on June 12th after probably the most pathetic excuse for a siege I've ever heard of. Incidentally, for the rebels, this actually strengthened Ferdinand's position. After the end of the siege, the pathetic siege though it was, Protestant homes were searched for weapons, mass arrests occurred, and Ferdinand was able to gain support from his more hesitant Catholic subjects. 
This would eventually lead to the first pitched battle of the war. Rebel forces still in Bohemia of about 3,000 men under Ernst von Manfeld tried to reinforce another rebel army when they were intercepted by an imperial force 5,000 strong under Count Bouquet. Mansfeld retreated to the outskirts of the town of Zablady, but they would eventually be surrounded there. Bouquet would eventually set fire to the town, and in the panic flight, his cavalry would cut down a large percentage of the enemy as they were routing from the city and eventually would corner them in the nearby woods. Rather than killing these men, the rebels actually agreed to join Bouquet's army for a month's pay, which, well, let's just say these guys, the rebels, were not very well paid. So he just said, hey, why don't you join us? We'll, we'll actually pay you. And they're like, sure, why not? Though dead serious, that's what happened. This is going to happen a lot, just so you know, um, throughout the 30s, where people are going to be switching sides left, right, and center. Basically, like whatever side has the most gold flowing, it's like, you know, this is the shape of things to come. In any case, Mansfeld himself and about 15 of his followers managed to cut their way through the Imperial forces, and they eventually would reach a friendly garrison who promptly shot at him, thinking him to be an Imperial officer because, you know, he's just, he, he was not having a good day. Let's put it that way. Um, Mansfeld would eventually convince them that, no, he in fact was a friendly and they would stop shooting at him and he was safe. But, you know, just a bad day is a bad day. Well, in any case, with all these conflicts going on, Ferdinand was much more secure in his position. And after some politicking here, greasing some palms there, granting concessions, you know, doing all that sort of stuff, Ferdinand would eventually be elected the Holy Roman Emperor on August 28, 1619. In spite of this, Bohemia was not pacified. The rebels would regroup and form the Bohemian Confederation, which also included other provinces of Moravia, Silesia, and Upper and Lower Lusatia. Now, this was a mixed bag of allies, to say the least. Moravia, for example, only joined due to force and threat of invasion, which actually happened to them a bit earlier. We talked about it when Matthias III invaded Moravia. He managed to turn about a third of the imperial forces there against their original employers. And the Moravians actually wanted to stay neutral in this conflict, but they were forced to join the rebels pretty much at, you know, pike point or gun point or sword point. In any case, they didn't really want to be there. They wanted to be neutral, but they were forced to join the rebels and they weren't too happy about it. So that's basically, you know, the kind of situation the rebels found themselves in. Any of it, the Confederation would reject Ferdinand as their king, stating that he was never actually elected properly. So they needed a leader and the leadership role after some politicking eventually fell upon Frederick V. Now, Frederick was not a very decisive leader. He did not call up armies. He did not garrison troops. He did not lodge invasions preemptively against the Habsburgs. No, he actually, he and his advisors, after much deliberation, would eventually seek international support since they figured that the entire weight of the Holy Roman Empire was about to come crashing down on them. And their reception was, well, let's say lukewarm at best. The Dutch sent some troops and some money. They were embroiled in their own campaign against the Habsburgs, so maybe they just wanted to help undermine Habsburg power in some way and, you know, help them out whatever they could. But it was really not very much. Uh, the English, fellow Protestants, didn't really want to get involved. They made some overtures. You know, yeah, we'll, we'll help out eventually, but nothing really ever came of it. And the rest of Protestant Europe was dealing with their own internal struggles and really did not need the wrath of the Holy Roman Empire on them. So... Instead, they were forced to turn to their last hope, and that was Hungary. Now, the Hungarians, under the leadership of Bethel and Gabor, um, wanted to undermine Habsburg and imperial power, and gathered an army together and seized many important towns and garrisons within. Seized many important towns and garrisons, and eventually they would combine with the Bohemians and march towards Vienna. And once again, the capital was under attack. The Imperials, however, this time were ready. They were well provisioned for a siege and were basically on a war footing at this point. And an Imperial army under Count Bouquet, who was marching on Prague, was recalled and was turned towards defending Vienna. The defenders of the city now numbered 20,000, in addition to the local townsfolk who in, the, who in an emergency could be called up to defend their hometown. Once again, the besieging army had little in the way of artillery. And just when the siege was about to begin, the Hungarian client state of Transylvania was attacked, forcing the army to withdraw. Now, who attacked Transylvania? Well, the winged hussars. No, really, it was the winged hussars. Poland, 
with Imperial urging, sent a large force of troops, including Lizowski cavalry, which are light cavalrymen, Cossacks, another form of light cavalry raiders, you know, some winged hussars and a, you know, a number of other troops. Uh, they attacked into Transylvania, forcing the rebels to withdraw from their siege of Vienna. Now, Transylvania is kind of in a precarious, complex situation. Uh, they were independent, but they were claimed to be a client kingdom of both the Hungarians as well as the Ottoman Empire. And uh, it was considered a product of a proxy power of both of them. And uh, I'm not going to get into it because it's really complex and confusing and well beyond the scope of what we're talking about here. Eventually, fighting would break out between the Polish and the Ottomans, and actually the Protestant rebels in Bohemia actually tried to forge an alliance with the Ottoman Empire, arguing that the Islamic powers were still better than dealing with a papist power. Ultimately, however, this conflict between the Poles and the Ottomans is considered a separate conflict from that of the Thirty Years' War. Just interesting to know that this eventually did lead to a conflict between those two, and yeah, there you go. So, yes, due to all of this, the Ottomans are now getting involved in, and the Poles are getting involved. And basically, things are starting to ramp up on an international level. Ultimately, however, this is well beyond the scope of what we're talking about here. So, moving on. While all this was going on, however, Ferdinand was still in need of allies in order to crush the Bohemian Revolt once and for all. So, we turn to Duke Maximilian, the Elector of Bavaria. Now, Maximilian had many ambitions. For example, he wanted to forge his own power block within the Holy Roman Empire, which put him at odds with Ferdinand. With the situation as dire as it was, Ferdinand was forced to give concessions to Maximilian, including the establishment or the reestablishment of the Liga, or the Bavarian power block that was dissolved earlier, which put the two men at odds with one another. Now, this shows the naturally fragmented nature of the Holy Roman Empire. Ferdinand, even though he was the emperor, still had to play politics and could not simply command his vassals to help. He actually had to grant concessions. He had to basically ask for help from his subordinates rather than just saying, OK, guys, we're going to war. Let's get to it. He had to, you know, he had to play the political game, which just shows you how, you know, the Holy Roman Empire was set up. And even after these concessions were granted, however, Maximilian was still very slow to act. After his arrangements with Ferdinand, he still sought papal approval, making sure that you know he wasn't violating any strictures of previous agreements between the Catholics and the Protestants. After the Pope granted his blessing, Maximilian assembled an army in order to crush the Bohemian Rebellion. He moved with the host as its leader, but most of the journaling was actually done by, by Jean Sercles Tilly who we are going to be talking about a lot more. He is one of the main players of the conflict, and we're going to be hearing about him in future episodes. In any case, soon pieces were moving all along the chessboard of Europe, and the confrontation, without sounding too much like kings and generals, was inevitable. This would eventually lead to the conflict at the Battle of White Mountain, which we will talk about in a future video. So that is it for this video. Please hit the like and subscribe button. More videos of various sorts will be coming out whenever I get around to it. And have a good day. Or don't have a good day. You're adults. You can have any kind of day you want. See you later.